starting. Uh, and now I want to welcome everybody um, to the program tonight. I thank you for giving us part of your your evening. Um, and the library thanks you for you know the, your continued support. Um, just to go over again uh, how the the program is going to go. Uh, Joanna has uh, has her slideshow that, she, that we're going to go through. Uh, it's uh, going to be pretty good. And I think what we've decided the best way to do it is for all of you to keep your microphones off um, for the presentation. That way we're not taking, uh, you know, speaker view isn't going to uh, suddenly snap back to one of us on the couch with a car going past our house or something. Um, and we'll just stick with Joanna. Uh, and then if you do have any questions, you can either uh, one, put it in the chat, which I'm gonna be watching the whole time, or two, you can uh, just unmute yourself uh, and jump in and ask. Um, with that being said, I'm gonna uh, mute myself and I'm gonna turn it over to Jody and Joanna. Okay. Um, hi, everybody, welcome. My name's Jody Sussler. I'm the current president of the Orange County Audubon Society. And uh, yeah, we're very excited to have Joanna Lentini present. She was the winner of the 2020 National Audubon Photography Contest. And um, she will give you more information about herself, I hope, uh, before she starts her presentation and what kind of work she does. Um, as Bram said, you know, please do um, share any questions you have either in the chat, which he'll be monitoring, or if you have a question about a specific photo, you know, feel free to, uh, I don't know, either click the raise my hand feature under the chat. I don't know if we have that. Do we have that? No, we don't. So uh, you can just turn on your mic if you'd like and just say, excuse me, I have a question. Um, and then Joanna can decide if this is a good time to talk about it or talk about it at the end. Um, and I just want to let everyone know that the Orange County Audubon Society um, is a um, bird and nature conservation organization here in Orange County. We are a chapter member of the National Audubon Society. Um, if you have questions about us or you want to know about more of our programs, um, you can look us up online at orangecountyaudubonsociety.org. Um, you can email us and I will put that information in the chat sometime later um, that you can also look up if you would ever like to take a copy of the chat uh, to look at later. You open up, you click on chat and at the bottom in the lower right hand corner, you'll see three dots. You click on that and you can click where it says save chat and it will save it to your desktop in a folder called Zoom. Um, and uh, that's it. Welcome. We have a lot of things coming up in the spring and uh, we hope you'll join us. And thank you to Bram and the Albert Wisner Public Library for co-sponsoring this program. Joanna? Yep, sounds good. Thank you. Um, should I, maybe let me share my screen really quickly before we get started. Um, Okay. Uh, sorry, everyone. Uh, just give me one second. I think this is it. Okay. Uh, everybody can see my screen, hopefully. Looks good. Looks good. Thanks, uh, well, hello and uh, welcome. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, and to share my snow geese journey with, with you all. Um, many thanks to uh, the library and the Orange County uh, Audubon chapter for having me. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm a photographer and writer based in Hudson Valley. Um, over the last 10 years, I've spent time living and working um, in Southeast Asia, Europe, um, and most recently in North America. Uh, my work tends to focus on conservation and outdoor adventure, um, and I specialize a bit in underwater photography. 
And in fact, that's really kind of how I started uh, about 10 years ago. Um, you know, my work's been recognized and published and exhibited internationally. And I've led a few trips from Antarctica to Mexico's Baja Peninsula. In fact, I just returned late last night from a photo shoot in Baja. So if I seem really exhausted, um, you know why. Um, but aside from this recent assignment, I've been pretty much laying low, trying to stay safe and capture the beauty of the natural world in my own backyard. Um, now, my lifelong obsession with the natural world did not begin with birds, but they have certainly made their imprint on me these last five or so years. Um, so my journey into photographing the greater snow goose population was purely by happenstance. Um, it was March of 2015 and I was home visiting from Poland where my husband and I lived for a few years. I was home for just a couple of weeks and I had heard snowy owls were spotted along the New Jersey shore. Uh, I grew up in New Jersey, so I was visiting with my mother and <laughs> I, I dragged her along with me to Long Beach State Long Beach Island State Park. Um, it was a really windy day and the waves were pretty wicked. Um, you know, I grew up going to Long Beach Island State Park, but I never spent much time there in March and uh, the wind whipped right through us. Um, and as the day kind of faded away, I realized, you know, I needed to come to terms with the fact that I wasn't going to, going to see any, uh, any owls. Um, and around the time that I was ready to give up and head home, um, I bumped into a woman who had seen the owls just an hour or so prior. And she could definitely see the uh, disappointment in my face. Um, you know, it was pretty sad. And so she, um, she told me about a mass migration of snow geese happening a few hours west of where we were standing. And in fact, her husband um, was there. So I got back into the car. I started to warm up. Uh, I tossed the idea out there to my mom and she said, let's go. And off we went. Um, you know, it was quite a few hours driving west into the setting winter sun. Um, and I knew we were cutting it close, but we pressed on. And I'm so glad that we did, uh, because what I witnessed that evening was nothing I have ever encountered before, um, had ever encountered before. And not to sound pretentious, but I've encountered some pretty amazing nature events, uh, you know, mainly underwater. Um, and so, you know, I knew like, as I approached this place, I, I, before I even saw a snow goose, I knew I was in the right place. Um, I was out in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Um, and as I arrived on this long winding country road, there was, I don't know what seemed like hundreds, maybe it was dozens of cars parked. Um, and I rolled down my window and I could actually hear the honking of the geese before I, before I set my eyes on them. Um, and so, that was my first encounter. Um, it's very short lived. It was maybe uh, an hour that I had with them, maybe 45 minutes at most before the sun was gone. Um, and there was about 50,000 geese that day. And to me, I was just, it was amazing. I mean, it seemed like 100,000 or, you know, 200,000. It was just, there was just so many. Um, and in fact, at times uh, during the migration, you can actually encounter, you know, upwards of, you know, 150,000, 200,000 if you if you time it right. Um, so, um, you know, I, there was this basically like as I approached, they were in this open rolling field adjacent to a lake where they spend the night. Uh, and there's thousands upon thousands of these fluffy white geese um, just kind of moseying about. You know, some seemed on high alert, looking to the sky, while others like were nibbling on the dry, dormant vegetation. Um, still, some were really like relaxed and just resting. Uh, and then one by one, as if like a white blanket were being lifted off the ground, their black tip wings furiously flapped as they took to the sky. Um, and then they settled down once again. And they kind of do this every, every evening. Um, they kind of, I, I'm not quite sure what it is, um, Maybe there's a predator, maybe it's just they, they haven't figured out exactly where it is that they, they want to rest for the evening. But I was mesmerized, um, you know, from the sounds of thousands of wings flapping uh, to the golden light that like wrapped around them to their, their calls, um, you know, my senses were overwhelmed and in a good way. Um, I drove home that evening and I felt truly alive. Like I put my head down on my pillow that night and I closed my eyes and I was there all over again. 
you know, having grown up not too far from there, I was really sad by the fact that I didn't know that this event took place every year, every winter. Um, but I was also really certain that I wasn't going to miss it going forward. Uh, and so for the last five years, I've traveled each winter uh, to observe and photograph the greater snow geese uh, population. And each time I visit with them, it really feels like the first time. I have uh, a very short video clip. Um, it's super short, I'm sorry, I wish I had more. Um, but just to give you an idea of what the vibe is like during the migration. And I hope, I hope it's going to play and you guys will be able to hear it. Was everybody able to hear that? Graham? Anyone? Can you play uh, it again? Yes, I could. That's not 50,000, that's 50 million. <laughs> Um, Wait, quite... when this was what part of the year so this is every every february march uh late february early march okay thanks yeah and you know i'm not quite sure which year this was from this might have been from last year or the year before that video um but you know it's just one perspective right so the geese are all around me behind me you know in the air behind me on the ground um yeah, it's just, it's really uh, spectacular. Um, so, uh, you know, it's just, you know, it, it's, it's a feast for the senses, really. I mean, if you time it right at the peak, like I said, you might be able to see 100 to 200,000 geese migrating. Uh, this year, I'm going to spend a, a week with the, with the birds at the end of February. Um, if anyone would like to get involved, there are details on my website. It's awildlife.co. Um, or you can, you know, just shoot me an email. Uh, and we can jump on a call to discuss. But, you know, I realize it's a really difficult time for travel, especially having just traveled to Baja and now in quarantine. Um, it's, um, you know, being able to stay close to home and, and have something, you know, as grand as this, you know, so close and accessible. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite ideal. And, you know, one of the safer activities that we can do as it's all outside. So, um, <clears throat> You know, before I get into some of the basic photography techniques, um, I'd like to give you a bit of an overview about the geese and their migration. Um, I tend to think, you know, absorbing as much information about whatever subject I'm photographing really helps me get into the right place, both mentally and physically, right, um, to make good images. So the greater snow goose migrates twice a year, mostly along the Atlantic flyway. Um, in late winter, they start making their way north to their breeding grounds in the Canadian High Arctic, um, which you can see at the top of the map in the blue. Um, but, you know, by the fall, they start making their way south again to their wintering grounds, uh, which you can see highlighted in the red along the coastal regions of the mid-Atlantic states. So the breeding grounds are actually situated in the Mississippi Flyway, where the lesser snow goose population also breeds. Um, However, the breeding grounds of the two populations do not mix. Um, and as I've only observed and photographed the greater snow goose, I'm not going to get into the other population at all. Um, but it's good to know that there is a larger population farther west and that there are roughly 15 million uh, lesser snow geese. Um, so, um, you know, the geese are very early risers. Um, they rise early to you know, head off to forage. And as a photographer, I need to be up really, you know, quite early, uh, well before the sun, uh, to be ready, you know, in position for, you know, where where they're going to take off and, and head out. Um, and so mornings and evenings tend to be the, like the best time to photograph them. Um, it's something that you really do not want to miss. Um, watching them to prepare to take off for the day is quite a sight. It, always involves a few like false alarms, uh, you know, where maybe a few thousand will take off and then they'll come back and circle, they'll circle back in the land. Um, but when they all agree it's time to go, <laughs> you only have a couple of minutes at most to capture um, this 
magnificent departure. Um, some might not go very far at first, they might just land nearby, um, but eventually they do disperse into the nearby fields to uh, forage on uh, waste grains. And so through the years, the species has adapted to um, eating waste grains, uh, which some say has played a part in their population explosion. Um, at the beginning of the 20th century, there were only a few thousand snow geese, and now there are millions. Um, the greater snow goose, it's about roughly a million, uh, but with the other populations, the lesser and the Rosses, um, they make up the world's most abundant waterfowl species. And they're hardy birds, uh, capable of traveling great distances in a single day, and can reach speeds of 50 miles per hour. Uh, during migration season, some have been known to travel 1,500 miles in 24 hours. Um, so, you know, at a time when many other bird species are on the decline, um, I think, you know, these guys, like, should really be acknowledged and celebrated. Um, so these images here were captured um, in the marshes around the Outer Banks of North Carolina last January. Um, I've never been able to create images like this um, on their migration. Um, they seem to be more, you know, they seem to be in much more of a hurry in March. Um, so it was nice to kind of catch them, you know, as, as they kind of were a little bit more, um, I mean, they're just, just a bit slower. Uh, they, they weren't, um, there weren't as, as many numbers and, um, you know, but this was about as far south as I have gone to photograph them. I believe that, you know, you can find them as far south as like northern South Carolina. Um, but as you can see here, um, hopefully uh, you can tell their, their white feathers tend to get a bit stained from foraging uh, in the dirt. Uh, they tend to eat the roots of dormant marsh plants, um, as that tends to be where a lot of nutrients are stored during the colder months, as well as other aquatic uh, vegetation and coastal plants. So, you know, as they prepare for their migration, they can feed up to like 12 hours a day, which is pretty, pretty amazing. Um, <clears throat> okay. So, in the winter prior to migration, I have personally found the geese to be more widespread and in smaller flock sizes. And at times I have definitely felt like I was on a wild goose chase, um, you know, but once you do find them, the smaller flock sizes can be helpful in creating, um, you know, intimate portraits of individuals, you know, but getting close enough to them, I found to be a bit challenging, even with a telephoto lens. Um, you know, I've also sensed that they are a bit more skittish prior to migrating and maybe has something to do with their smaller flock sizes. But that's just, you know, my opinion. I, I, I'm not quite, quite sure what it is. Um, I think, you know, there's, there's safety numbers for sure. Um, and they feel a lot more confident as they migrate. So, um, but during the migration at peak numbers, I have struggled to create clean compositions and isolate individuals from the rest of the flock. So there's like a trade-off, right? Um, as you can see here, in that sort of situation, I just tend to rely on shallow depth of field, uh, a small F number, to blur the background uh, and separate them from the rest of the flock. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, you can get lucky and one or two can be found wandering off on their own, but that's rare because, as I said, there's safety in numbers. Um, from what I've heard from biologists, they usually, the ones that you can find off on their own are either sick or injured. Um, although the ones that I have found, uh, they seem, they seem okay to me. I don't know, maybe just more, more introverts, I guess. Uh, I don't know. Um, I haven't really encountered any, any birds, really any geese, um, that, but you know, that seem like they're, like they're not doing too well, like they're sick. Um, luckily. So I'm just going to grab a sip of water, excuse me for one second. Okay, so I love filling the frame with geese in flight, um, and I tend to experiment with, you know, slower shutter speeds for that. But when it comes to shutter speeds, I think, um, you know, there's no right or wrong answer. I enjoy showing a bit of movement in the wings, like in the image to the left, with a slower shutter speed. But I also like to create sharp images with everything in focus. Um, 
you know, I'll create a variety of images when I shoot and that involves slow and fast shutter speeds to capture the movement or freeze the motion, right? Um, so as you can see in the image on the left, I use a shutter speed of 1 30th of a second and the wings are blurred. While the image on the right is really sharp at 1 4,000th of a second. Um, and then for this image, um, it's a bit of an abstract image that I created in the marshes around Delaware. Um, I used a slight penny motion um, and a slower shutter speed of one eighth of a second. And I quite liked the results. Um, you know, it was a really windy evening and, you know, along with the diminishing light of fast shutter speed, just it just wasn't ideal. Um, and, you know, a lot of people think that there are no colors to be found in winter, um, but I really don't agree with this. I, you know, while it is subtle, the color is definitely out there. And winter is one of my favorite times for photography. Um, you just have to be willing to bundle up in the right gear. Otherwise, you just, you won't be out there very long. Um, I always like to dress in layers. I keep a pair of micro spikes in the car for icy conditions. Um, you know, I, I always have them with, a, with the snow geese. Um, and definitely a full face mask to just, you know, protect your face from the wind and multiple layers to protect against the elements, of course. Um, for me, like there's no point in rising early if I'm not dressed appropriately. I know, I just know I won't be out there very long uh, and I won't create great images if I'm cold. So something to think, of, you know, keep in mind. <clears throat> so in my camera bag, I like to carry a variety of lenses. Um, oops. Hmm. <sighs> <laughs> My slides are in the wrong. Okay, let's see. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go here. Okay, so in my camera bag, I like to carry a, a variety of lenses with me, um, such as wide, mid-range, and telephoto. You know, the wide and the telephoto tend to get used the most. Um, you know, to tell their story, I try to document the wider scene in addition to some portraits and behavioral shots, whether that's foraging or them preening or in flight. Um, occasionally bald eagles will attack wintering geese um, and I've seen that but I haven't actually captured that on camera yet as it's usually way too far off in the distance uh, and just you know you have to be kind of lucky for that one but um, yeah um, okay now I'm going to go back sorry guys to this one um, so a telephoto lens can also be helpful in documenting banded geese. Um, for example, I was able to photograph the goose in the center with a 100 to 400, 100 to 400 millimeter lens. Uh, from there, I went to um, the University of Laval's banding page and I entered in the band number, um, which um, <clears throat> brought me these results. So after submitting it to the researchers, I was able to see when the goose was banded and other sightings. Um, from this screenshot, you can see it was first banded on, I'm not sure if I'm saying this correctly, uh, Violet Island uh, in late October of 2019 uh, and spotted it in Pennsylvania in the winter of 2020, uh, a few times. Um, so Violet Island is not only their breeding grounds, but it's an important site for uh, many migratory birds. And it was established as a Canadian bird sanctuary in 1965. So that's where this bird here, it's a, uh, I can't quite see it. Uh, y, oh, there it is on the left, YC10. Um, so I'm gonna definitely keep an eye out for this one, um, you know, this, this, uh, this February for sure. Um, but, you know, I don't see very many banded birds. Um, so, um, you know, it's just something to think about when you're out there photographing them. Um, you know, you can provide you know, useful information to, to, to researchers. Um, they've actually been studying them for, since the eighties. So, um, so yeah, something to, to think about. Um, you know, some say their population size has contributed to uh, degraded habitat. Um, I hear this a lot. And, um, but from what I've researched, it seems like it's more the lesser snow goose population, the one that's farther west. Um, either way, you know, providing the band numbers to researchers can be really helpful. Uh, in determining an array of things. And this is an image here, it's not my image, I pulled this from the internet, it's um, 
of their Arctic breeding grounds. Um, I was supposed to travel travel up there uh, last June, um, but with the pandemic, of course, uh, that wasn't an option. Um, but yeah, this um, I might actually have the opportunity this coming summer with a Canadian researcher and colleague. Um, but again, you know, with the current situation, who knows what will what will happen. Um, but yeah, as you can see, it's um, you know it's pretty desolate. Um, but it's this is this is where they go. This is where they spend half their year. This is where they raise their young. So it's uh, quite an extreme environment. Okay, so going back, no, going forward, okay. Um, but yeah, getting back to some photography techniques, I think it's super important, you know, as I mentioned earlier, to just really understand the geese well enough to anticipate their next move, right? Um, and that just comes with time. Um, and that's really important with all wildlife photography. I think the more time that you spend with an animal, you know, the better better able you are to, to photograph them. Um, you know, you're just, you're, you know what they're going to do before they do it. Um, and um, yeah, and I think also taking notes. Uh, I didn't do that early on and I, I regret it, um, but definitely taking notes is, you know, as, as ridiculous as it may seem sometimes, uh, you know, you might come back to something later on and, you know, you just, you might realize and cover something that, you know, wasn't possible before. So um, yeah, just spending time and observing them and taking notes can definitely help improve your photography, uh, you know, at a much faster rate, I think. So um, it's also important to note that when you are photographing wildlife that you should try to do so at eye level. Um, you know, this can really help put the viewer into their world, um, you know, rather than shooting down at them. I'm going to say that you know, there's always exceptions to every rule. Uh, and hopefully, you know, when you're in that situation, when, you know, it's time to break the rule, you'll recognize it. But, you know, ge general rule of thumb is, you know, get at eye level um, for sure. How close would they let you get? You know, like in the winter, in their wintering grounds, um, like I said, they're a bit skittish. Um, and it was difficult because there weren't so many. I felt like, you know, out, when they're on their migration, they, there's just so many, there's like limited space. Um, I have been at times, they have walked right up to me within a few feet. Um, but mostly I'd say, uh, you know, maybe 150 feet average. So yeah, I mean, oh, sorry guys. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, as you can hopefully see, um, you know, snow geese are quite an abundant, beautiful and super accessible species that's, that are really close to home. Um, if you guys are interested in learning more, uh, there is a great book by author, I'm going to mess this up, William Fames. it's F-I-E-N-N-E-S, um, Fames. I don't know, called The Snow Geese. Uh, I highly recommend it. Um, as well as a short novel uh, by Paul Gallico called The Snow Goose. Uh, it's really short read. It's like 60 pages and it's a beautiful story. Um, so yeah, um, you know, of course, you know, if you'd like to join me in the field this coming February, uh, you know, please, you know, ask me, you know, questions now or shoot me an email. Um, I'm going to be there from the 21st to the 27th. Um, and uh, yeah, would love for you to join me. I also have a, um, a, an ebook on my website, which you can download for free. Um, and I also have a fine art website, uh, just joannalentinifineart.com. And please, um, you know, it'd be great to see you connect on Instagram or Facebook or wherever. So I guess that's it. Does anybody have any questions? Hi, thank you for the wonderful photographs. Um, I would, do you have any tips on tracking them or finding them? I've gotten lucky. Uh, they live, they've migrated close to where I live. Uh, last year, I got to uh, get really close and it was uh, everything you said. Oh my God, life changing, unbelievable. <laughs> but now this year, um, I want to, you know, do you have any tips on like, okay, this is where I should go. 
Yeah, sure. you should come with me. <laughs> <laughs> but between um, now and then, how about that? <laughs> yeah, between now and then, I mean, yeah, certainly you can, you know, all along the coastal regions of like New Jersey, Delaware, um, you know, all the way down to the Outer Banks. Um, when I was in the Outer Banks, though, I found that they, um, uh, talking with a few biologists, they, they seem to be moving a little bit more west. I guess the Atlantic Flyway is shifting a bit. Um, so I did find them like a couple of hours inland. Um, well, almost found them. Um, I had to head out because I was in the middle of nowhere and it was it was a little sketchy. And I just, yeah, I just didn't know where I was. It was my first time there. and But I did find out later from a few birders that they ended up back there. So, you know, anywhere along the coastal, coastal regions, um, you know, you can usually see them, spot them early in the morning or in the evening coming back in, in you know, a good size, like maybe a thousand, you know, a thousand geese. Um, so, you know, always look to the skies, but yeah, all along the coastal regions. Are there any like uh, Maryland, websites Delaware. that- I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was just wondering if there's any websites that track them. Ah, uh, that track them? Um, not that I'm aware of. I mean, I guess there's, um, you know, the, the normal ones for, but yeah, um, not specifically for snow geese that I'm aware of. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? <laughs> so um, do they how, do they smell bad? No, <laughs> not at all. No, I don't think so. Um, yeah, but you know, usually my nose is frozen because it's so cold. So, um, well, they mainly eat uh, plants. They're not. They're not uh, trying to get under the ice into the water for anything. Yeah, no. So they will definitely um, go after aquatic plants. They spend time, you know, with both. And then, of course, you know, you can find them in cornfields as well. Um, uh, just you know, kind of. The waste that they're you know picking on so um but that you know like cornfields tend to be pretty big and you know i've i've seen them in cornfields and that's just yeah it's tough unless you want to you know go into private property <laughs> no one else nobody has any more any questions hmm so are there other birds that are in big flocks that you've tracked and photographed or? Um, you know, I photographed, um, <clears throat> I photographed puffins um, breeding in Svalbard. I photographed little auks breeding as well uh, there. Um, and they were pretty, pretty incredible. Um, you know, um, and that's actually like that trip to Svalbard, that was, that was like kind of where my my fascination with birds kind of took hold. Um, it was it was the middle of July, and you know we we're up on the on the cliffs. I was with a biologist and um, and another photographer, and yeah, it was just you know we we're under the midnight sun, right? So it was like you know nine ten o'clock at night, and the light was gorgeous, and the birds just coming right past you. Um, the sounds of their their wings flapping and the light, yeah, it was it was incredible. Wow. Yeah. There was just a, a photo I think on the um, National Audubon site about um, the the puffins nesting in like holes between the rocks that they sort of go in between the ledges and they're very yeah. hard to see. They fly over the water so close and so fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're characters for sure. They, um, they're funny birds. I like them. Um, one of one of the guys that I was with, he had a, a bright orange jacket on, and they were just so intrigued by it. They just, you know, they kept kept going up to him and, and checking him out, and it was definitely the color. I don't know. Was it the color of the band on their beaks? Yeah, it was very similar. <laughs> very similar so um but yeah um you know i i guess i should mention you know if you go farther west I, you know the lesser snow geese population it's um 
it's supposed to be pretty insane. Um, I've just been photographing this for so long that I, I kind of want to see it through from, you know, you know, the wintering grounds to the, to the Arctic. So um, but once I do that, then maybe I'll start to head west and check out the other population. But can you imagine like 15 million birds migrating? No. Um, so I hear that, you know, you do see like, you know, while at the peak in, in, in you know, in the Atlantic flyway, you can see 150, 200,000, um, you know, farther west, I'm sure it's, it's, it's many more, it's, you know, way up there, so, yeah. Joanna, do you ever do any drone photography? Uh, not with the birds, but I do. Have you ever thought about having a drone kind of join the migration for uh, five or 10? Yeah, I think that would be probably kind of dangerous for them. Um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't think that, yeah, I'd probably stay away from that. Um, I actually, I, have, I know someone who was just telling me that she was flying, uh, a, friend of, a friend of a friend was flying a drone out in, um, out in Baja and a pelican attacked it and it went, went right into the ocean. Oh, wow. um, but yeah, I mean, I wouldn't really necessarily be so concerned about, you know, the bird attacking it as opposed to the birds, you know, just being scared and, and, and you know, harming the birds as well. So uh, probably recommend to stay away from that. Um, and you know, obviously too, just like keep your distance, you know, like as with, with all wildlife, you know, just try, you know, if they, if they approach you, it's one thing, but you know, like giving them their personal space is super important. Um, we saw some video about a guy who actually would fly his ultralight bicycle pedal mm. ultralight and join these migrations. That's amazing. I've seen that video. You've seen that? Yeah. That guy's amazing. Yeah. Parallel. Doesn't he, um, he works with the geese, right? He like, he, the, he's like a rehabilitator or something, I believe. Oh. I'm, I don't know. I just remember him flying I don't remember his bio so well as his the, photos. With them. And yeah. they were doing a lot of studying of, you know, yeah. how, 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 does, how does the movement of one bird affect the others in the... In Wait, the wasn't this guy actually trying to lead birds to a different place? Oh, Possibly, I yeah. I mean, I, it's been a while since I've seen it, but... I think he was like some bird who was trying to alter uh, the bird migration. Uh, to get them to better lands because they were going hmm. places that weren't safe for them anymore. I don't know. It was a weird. Uh, what was that called? My I life. I think is it was a called wind winged migration. Well, I thought it was called my life. Is a goose. No, I don't know. Oh, uh, one thing I didn't mention in my presentation. Um, so the flocks of snow geese, they're known as wavies uh, because they don't form like the normal like V. They're kind of more like all over the place so oh, i forgot to add that have to do that Wave. yeah Wavies, yeah so it's harder to tell the the, pa the pa pattern if they have a pattern or not or is or do this do well i think you know when they're flying that that's you're you know if they're up really high then you can kind of tell them apart from you know other other species as well but they kind of just it's like chaos it's absolute chaos when they take off and it's a beautiful chaos yeah, they're just all over the place. Um, it's quite exciting. You guys have to come with me. I wonder if you could camouflage a drone as a bird. <laughs> Maybe you could fly above them. Mm. Well, you but you don't know whether they they're go. going up or you don't know. What no, but they were saying that in, um, uh, so the blackbirds do a murmuration where they all fly in the big wavy circles together. And then, um, oh, I forget, I think it might have been finches. Somebody will correct me if I'm wrong. But, but the, the, the ornithologists were looking at it and they figured out that um, the movement of one bird affects the movement of seven around them. So, you know, it sort of goes out from that, you know, in, in a pattern. And, and I guess, you know, from observation that it was pretty clear to be able to see what was happening, but but you're saying in the wavies, it looks more chaotic. They don't really move as one. It's sort of just like a big. Flat I mean, they do, but it's just a little. It's not as, yeah. 
not as neat. Yeah, not as fluid and yeah. 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 Have you ever seen the snow geese migration? No. It's quite a sight. Yeah. It's just like all of your worries, everything just gone. So how many people can go on the uh, observation trip with you at the end of February? <laughs> oh gosh. Um, oh, I thought you meant to, to Canada, to the, the high Arctic. Oh, I, was, I, I was doing step one. <laughs> uh, yes. So I'm doing a, a you know, very small group. Um, so yeah, like maximum like five. Um, yeah. So um, you know, it's all outside. It's, you know, everybody can keep their distance. We're all going to be covered anyway, because it's cold. It's chilly. I won't lie. But it, I don't know. The adrenaline, it, it kind of warms you up. It's, um, yeah, you just have to see it. Yeah. And how long are you usually out? So it's mornings and evenings um, during the day, you know, downloading, editing, resting. Uh, because we do get up early um, and uh, yeah so it's it's more like the evenings are more um, I like I tend to prefer the evenings even though I love to see them take off you know and head out for the day the evening you know you had they kind of come back a little bit earlier and so you have like you have you have more time with them you have more light um, and I don't know I just they seem to be kind of more social at that time too. Uh, so yeah, mornings and evenings, just um, like an, you know, up an hour before sunrise, hour and a half, have breakfast, make your way out there. It's in a, it's in a little bit of a remote area. So it's, you know, requires a bit of a drive um, from the accommodation. So yeah, it's, um, then you have the rest of the day and it's, um, you know, there's other things to do in the region. So I believe there's a wolf sanctuary around and um a couple of other things so are you uh are you talking about lakota wolf preserve i believe that might be the name no. oh, that's right i live yeah i live about maybe five ten miles from there in pennsylvania uh i live in new jersey oh, okay so no right yeah, on this... the new jersey pennsylvania border where the delaware water gap is yeah i haven't i haven't been out there i've been meaning to for years um but no this is um this is another wolf sanctuary it's in um it's in like central Pennsylvania. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would love to check out like, that that sanctuary. I mean, too. And the and the snow geese come right through here too, so that's why. Um, yeah. Right, uh, we live. Yeah, right. I've been I've been trying to like figure out like some good spots, like you know, it, it's a good drive for me. It's it's about three hours from here, um, so it's. Um, you know, to the migration. But yeah, I mean, in terms of like, you know, finding them in large numbers, I haven't been able to nail down another um, location like between here and, and Canada. That's like, you know, where you have, where you have a lot, so. Well, maybe I'll help you out if they come through here again. Cause it was a mile away from our house. And, oh, nice. And yeah. we, you know, ever, like, like you said, you hear them. Oh yeah. And it's, yeah. you know, it's pretty uh, overwhelming. I, I'm not a big gearhead, but I am curious what type of what type of camera equipment to use. Um, so I shoot with Canon, and mm -hmm. so like I'll have like a 16 to 35 millimeter with me. I'll have a 24 to 70 and a 70. I just, yeah, 70 to 200 and 100 to 400. Yeah. Um, so, and I have a, a teleconverter as well. Um, so so 1.4. Um, and I use that quite a bit with the, um, the geese in the wintering grounds. Um, I had a 600 millimeter, but I don't have that any longer. Uh, it was just too much for me. I don't know. I just like to travel light and yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, um, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's not so much the gear. It's just, um, you know, being in the right spot and understanding, you know, what it is that you're photographing. And, yeah. It's not the gear, it's the perseverance. Exactly. <laughs> totally. You uh, know, it's funny, I'm just having this memory from high school all of a sudden uh, with your 
you're talking about the chaos of when they all take off. Mm -hmm. I remember being in assembly uh, at Germantown Friends and they're playing some movie about uh, a natural phenomenon or I don't even know really what it was, but the scene I'll never forget is they showed a very similar uh, image of birds mm -hmm. doing their thing and flying around and then flying through each other was mm -hmm. the, you know where they the, they come around and they fly oh i love that like yeah. right through each other and nobody knocks anybody out of the sky mm -hmm. and the narrative was something like ever wonder how birds can do this <laughs> and then it just cut to an aerial photograph somewhere down on wall street where there was huge crowds waiting for the lights to change. And then the yeah. light changed and the sea of people came from two different directions and went right through each other. Wow. And- uh, Birds are amazing. It was amazing to see how it's that same nonverbal uh, communication in a species that, mm. why would you crash into somebody? <laughs> You know, you're trying to go one way up the stairs and they're going the other way. You don't crash into them. Hmm. Uh, but it is phenomenal to see them fly around like that and go through each other. And it just all seems so coordinated somehow. Hmm. But it really isn't. It's just, it's innately coordinated. Have you seen um, the movie A Big Year? Yeah. A Big Year? Yeah. That... I can watch that over and over again. It's uh, one of my favorite movies. Um, yeah, I would watch. And it wasn't even a birder when I watched it. I was just like, wow, this is this is great. Because I mean, you can apply it to any like, you know, other other species as well. Just wildlife photography in general. Um, even though they're not photographers, it's still like totally the same concept, I guess. I love that movie. Yeah, that's if anybody movie. hasn't seen it, check it out. Joanna? Hi, Evan. Uh Hi, um, I wanted to mention before we got over the uh, program today that your uh, your win in the um, the photography competition that uh, you know the the that, that must have been quite a thrill for you. A as I learned after having seen that image, that you're a, a local person and like you walk and hang out in the same place as we do. It's like that must have been a huge thrill. Can you tell us about that a little bit? Uh, although it's off the topic of the birds that- Yeah, no worries. Yeah, Absolutely. it was really a, uh, it's a cool story, I think. I'd love to hear your, your perspective. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I, as I mentioned in the beginning, I, I lead trips to, um, to Baja, Mexico, um, normally every October uh, to, to swim with and photograph sea lions and whale sharks and mobula rays. Um, and we do a bit of camping. Um, and um, I was on one of those trips. I was leading one of those trips and um, I wasn't feeling so great. I decided that I was gonna, you know, kind of stay shallow and um, yeah. So basically, you know, like the highlight there where I was in Los Islotes, um, the highlight there is sea lions. And that's why I bring people there is for the sea lions. But that year in particular, um, 2019, uh, it was like late October, early November. Um, the, the, um, the sardines, there were sardines everywhere. I mean, you couldn't see uh, anything. It was just walls of sardines and the birds were, you know, all over it. Um, you know, you had pelicans diving, you had uh, the double crested cormorants. Um, and yeah, it was just, it was just incredible uh, to see these birds just, you know, kind of turn into fish, right? And just, um, I never actually did see one, you know, uh, catch a fish, um, but I was actually just back there and I just returned from the same place. And in January, it's a little bit of a different environment. It's very murky, uh, it's very cold. Um, and um, I did see the pelicans diving, but the visibility was pretty, pretty, pretty rough. Um, so, um, but yeah, I would, I, you know, that was just, I mean, for me, like I got into underwater photography and scuba diving because I watched so many nature documentaries and one in particular was the sardine run in South Africa. And I was mesmerized by the gannets, you know, diving like 60 meters into the water or 60 I'm always confused, 60 meters, I believe, um, you know, for the sardines. Um, so you have these massive, you know, 
uh, schools of sardines. And, you know, you have everything from sea lions and sharks to dolphins and whales to birds, everything just kind of coming at them. And the most exciting part for me was the gannets that were di diving down. Um, I was just like, ah, oh, I was like, I have to do this one day. All right. And, you know, my partner at the time, he's like, he looked at me and he was he just kind of laughed. He's like, but you don't even scuba dive. And, you know, I was like, yeah, well, I think I'm going to learn. And um, within a year, we, we actually started um, we got certified and, you know, I had a camera with me for my very first dive. So that was like a long, that shot was kind of like a long, that experience was a long time in the making um, for me uh, because, you know, it was why I started to dive just to really, to kind of photograph, you know, these birds diving. And then I just somehow like lost track of that, I guess, and didn't really kind of focus too much, you know, you know, focus on that. Um, you know, all these other things distracted me along the way. Um, and then it was just kind of, you know, happened and it was just right there. And yeah, it was, it was, it was, I had goosebumps, you know, I knew like as soon as like, yeah, it was, it was, it was beautiful. And I was shooting with natural light. So that was tough. Uh, you know, there were swells and, um, but yeah, it was, it was great. <laughs> you, you know, we hear about, uh, how the Nobel Prize winners hear of the fact that they've won. What was it? How did they notify you that you were the grand prize winner? What was that like? Yeah, you know, I had to read the, it was actually, it was either an email or a phone call. Um, I think it was kind of like both right around the same time uh, within like 24 hours. I can't remember which was first, but um, yeah, I, you know, I kind of like, I kind of had to go back and just say, wait a second, like, just to clarify, and I, and I was still, like, even, like, even, like, a little ways, you know, like, a few weeks into it, I was still a little confused. I was, like, yeah, I wasn't really fully processing it. I didn't really believe it. Um, uh, so, yeah, that, that was quite exciting, quite a... Uh, it was, it, it's a really big honor. deal, really big deal, so congratulations. Thank you so much, Evan. Appreciate it. Yeah, and I, you know, I usually run trips every October um, to this place, and obviously that's not happening right now, but I'm actually, I have a call on fr tomorrow's Friday, yeah, um, so you kind of start, you know, talking about that again. Um, I've kind of, like, just put it on hold right now, um, but let's see, let's see where the world, where everything takes us, um, but hopefully, hopefully by next year, you know, things will be, will be a bit better, so. Yeah. Um, any other questions or? Let's check the chat, see if anybody had any questions. So there weren't actually any questions in the chat. Um, William, Vanessa was thinking about your question about finding the geese uh, mm -hmm. and she recommended the eBird website. Are you guys familiar with that at all? Is that like reputable? Is that good? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a great resource. Yeah, gold stamp. And now she asks, um, do they band their necks rather than legs for visibility or is it for another reason? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I remember reading something about that. I think probably visibility, um, but I'm not 100% sure. It's the punky birds that lay down. <laughs> One of the, the things on, on eBird is that there are um, many spots that people post that are um, areas that are great for birding. I forget what they call them, but uh, one of them is our the Audubon Sanctuary at uh, Six and a Half Station Road in Goshen. Um, so you can look at that for local local mm -hmm. things or, you know, uh, to find like exciting new sightings or uh, look in other specific areas. Um, as well, you can create your own lists on there to share with people. So if you all of a sudden are overtaken by a few tens of thousands of snow geese flying over, you could post that on there and you'll get a bunch of people with binoculars and cameras out, you know, looking at them, enjoying Yeah, them. I think, uh, you know, just one thing to point out is, you know, obviously if the bird is, you know, the species is, you know, kind of threatened, endangered, um, just, you know, be careful with, I guess, you know, you know, sharing that information uh, sometimes, you know, it can, it can do more harm. Um, 
So yeah, yes. you'll see you'll see uh, sometimes more uh, you know seasoned birders and people who who get that um, basic idea um, might post later. You know, like two yeah. weeks ago, this you know very rare owl was sighted in this area where it never is. Um, and then, of course, the more intrepid birders will probably go out there the next year and try and add it to their mm. life list. It's actually, it's really exciting, though. I mean, in a lot of ways, um, you know, to see how many people have really gotten into birding over the last year uh, because of the pandemic and, you know, having to stay more local. And I have so many friends who just, you know, had no interest in birds and, uh, now I keep getting messages. Okay, yeah, I get it now. You know, they're pretty awesome. Um, when you take the time to like slow down and to really uh, you know, observe them. So, yeah. So. Um, one last thing in the chat. Diane says it was a great presentation and I agree. Thank you well so done. much. Appreciate it. Obviously, there's always something that you know you kind of want to want to you know forget to add or yeah, but yeah, thank you, I appreciate that. So yeah, if anybody has any questions, um, just wants to connect, you know, just in general. I mean, I'm new to the area to Orange County. I've been here two years. One of those years was, uh, you know, pretty much a pandemic. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, you know. Definitely, um, you know, for um, fellow photographer friends, birders, so reach out, please. Yeah, and maybe, uh, maybe uh, before the next big uh, migration next year, you'll want to put through this presentation again, and some people who missed out can join yeah. in. Yeah, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the migration now, it's, it's four weeks away, so... So good timing. Yeah. Even if you don't join me, just, you know, try to try to get out there to see it. Um, Do they come over, um, Do they yeah, come over uh, Orange County at all? I mean, I technically they do. Yeah. I mean, I just haven't figured out. I'm, I am not quite sure if there are just, you know, they're flying over or, you know, they're stopping anywhere. I should try to figure this out before, um, before it starts. Yes, figure that out because all of us should be out there hanging out and, and watching for this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I know that they stop over outside of Montreal, but um, I have a friend up there who has been photographing them. And it's pretty much like the only other person that I know that's totally into snow geese. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Um, so, yeah. Um, hopefully next year. Um, but yeah, it's, it's actually really interesting um, from that screenshot that I shared with everyone of the, um, the banding, the sightings. Um, you know, I hadn't realized how late in the fall, like they, I mean, I guess it's not late, it's mid fall, but to see that the, the goose was up in, you know, Violet Island on October 25th, um, that's like as far north as you can go. Um, you know, that's like the last bit of land, I do believe, before you reach the North Pole. So I was actually shocked to see that. Um, so they make their way back pretty quickly, you know, because by late November, um, they're already, you know, down by, down, down by Montreal. So, um, so yeah. are there any, um, sort of, uh, Twitter groups or similar ilk that uh, post, uh, okay, the snow geese were seen over uh, Oshkosh, Nebraska or wherever and uh, heading Northeast. Yeah, I mean, if there are, I haven't found them, um, but maybe I'll start one. I was just about to suggest that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would be cool. That would be very, very cool. So yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, anybody, anybody know that? Well, it looks like Jody just put a uh, the 
Orange County Audubon um, Facebook group or maybe the Facebook page uh, into nice. the chat. So that's probably one way. Yeah, that's the page. It's there. You'll see there's an older one that's out of out of commission. So just make sure it says ink on it. Because uh, I wanted everyone to just remind you that we're having a chapter meeting next Wednesday on Zoom. So if you're interested, you can register to get the Zoom link um, where we'll be talking more about what we do and how to get involved um, with the uh, Orange County Audubon Society. And also you can find there and on our website, a list of our programs and presentations, um, some of which are more informal chats um, and some of which are more formal <laughs> webinar type things. So anyway, I think oh. it's gone really well. If there's nothing that anyone else wants to say, then are we wrapping up? Oh. <clears throat> Thank you, Anna. This was a really, a really good uh, seminar you led. Thank you guys for having me. Really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, Jody and the Autobahn Society for sponsoring these um, and, and hosting them. And I want to thank everybody else for coming out too. It was, uh, it was very nice. Thank you. Yes, and thank you, Albert Wisner, Albert Fibre, and Graham, technical support. <laughs> All right. Have All a good right. night, everybody. Take care. Good night. Bye. Thank you.